Please do be seated. As Secretary and Clerk, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to this most beautiful of English cathedrals. And we do thank the Dean and Chapter for their kind permission in allowing us to hold our graduation ceremonies here. Graduation ceremonies follow a tradition that began in the 15th century, and that tradition has developed since. Roughly translated, graduation means taking a step. And graduation symbolizes the move of a former student, now called a graduand, into a new role in wider society as a graduate, there to use the talents developed as a member of this academic society. Each graduand will cross the stage and shake hands with the vice chancellor, and that will symbolize their transition to this new role, and we will applaud them for their success so far and in anticipation of their contribution to society in the future. At the end of the ceremony, the vice chancellor will formally admit all those who have crossed the stage, symbolizing that each and every graduate is now incorporated into the community of scholars. As new members of this community, as the academic procession leaves the stage, the new graduates will join the procession and that will conclude the proceedings. It is now time to begin our formal proceedings and so I hereby declare the ceremony to be in session and I call upon the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Ian Martin, to address you. Vice-Chancellor. Canon, graduands, family and friends, colleagues. As Vice-Chancellor of Anglia Ruskin University, it's my very great pleasure to be here today at your graduation ceremony. This is my first year at ARU, and this autumn's graduation celebrations are the first that I'm fortunate enough to be part of. Firstly, congratulations on reaching this milestone and graduating from your chosen course. Today is not only an opportunity to take stock and celebrate your achievements to date, but to look forward to the multitude of careers that stretch in front of each of you. These careers will undoubtedly be wide and varied, but they will be joined by a common theme that will touch on all of you. That theme is change, and unpredictable change at that. My academic background is medicine, but throughout my career, I've had a very active engagement with computer and digital technology. To put it bluntly, I'm a bit of a geek. I'm gonna use my academic career and my other experiences to put this context of change into perspective. It was the German philosopher Hegel who first commented that the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. 
He was correct in all but one aspect. We have learnt that we're terrible at predicting the future. You turn to the 19th century, they didn't get it very good. The telephone has too many shortcomings to be a serious means of communication. Western Union, 1876. The Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. Sir William Priest, chief engineer of the British Post Office. Everything that can be invented has been invented. The commissioner of the US Office of Patents. And who the hell wants to hear actors talk? H.M. Warner from Warner Brothers in 1927. You might say we've got better, but we haven't. Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM in 1949, I think there may be a world market for five computers. Popular Mechanics, 1949. Computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. And to bring it almost up to date, Bill Gates, 640K of RAM should be enough for anybody. I think I've made my point, but what does this mean for you? I think it means three things. Firstly, that the environment that you work in is going to be incredibly different by the time you retire. Secondly, you're going to fail if you try to predict that future too hard. And finally, as graduates of this university and members of the communities you enter into, we have individually and collectively a duty to shape that future. Somewhat scarily, your career is going to cover the next 45 years or so. How much change might we see? Let's go back 45, 46 years to 1970. History books for most of you. The Cold War was at its peak, the Vietnam War was raging, and Richard Nixon was the US president. There were two Germanys, and absolutely nobody could have foreseen this changing peacefully less than 20 years later. The Beatles, you might have heard of them, were just about to split up. Relevant to today, less than 10% of the population attended university. That's nearly 40% now. Average life expectancy was between 65 and 68 years. It's now nearly 80. A gallon of petrol as it was then cost around 20 pence, and commercial jet travel was unheard of for all but the very rich. To return to my geek background, the computers that make so much of this world possible, and indeed make the cathedral able to have a Twitter feed, were extraordinarily limited. The most up-to-date computer at that point ran at about one two hundred thousandths of the speed of a current computer that you all have on your desktop at home. Just to give you some context of how things have changed, if I bought the memory in the iPhone in my pocket in 1979 dollars, it would cost 1.6 billion US dollars. Just think, by the time you retire, what technology that currently costs 1 billion is going to be sitting in your pocket, making a difference? Just as technology has changed, medicine and healthcare and medical and healthcare practice has changed in some cases almost beyond recognition. The single common thread that sat behind those advances is the scientific application of the knowledge we have all paid a part in discovering, striving through the research to produce better clinical outcomes. Yes, we hear much about the failings of the modern healthcare system and the difficulties and shortcomings that it's currently facing. I, for one, do not doubt those challenges, but do not forget and celebrate what has been achieved over that time. None of you will have attended a school where a minority of children were in calipers as a consequence of polio, a fact conveniently lost on those who argue against immunization. The chances of surviving a childhood cancer has increased every year for the last six decades. And we have amazing technology that allows diagnosis and imaging in ways that we could not have imagined when I started my medical career in the mid-1980s. In both of these areas, and in many others, these advances are in large part only possible because of the parallel strands of education and research, the two things that define the university broadly and our university as well. They are why the university and a university education are so important and why you've worked so hard to be here today. At ARU, we are committed to delivering an outstanding educational experience for our students, carrying out research and innovation whose results transforms lives and communities, and working hard to support the economic, social, and cultural well-being of the communities we serve. 
We strive to see each of these assets improve year on year, and this year was no exception, as testified by external surveys and rankings. We had our best ever results in the National Student Survey. The Times Sunday Times rankings placed us our, our education experience among the top 20 in the country. And for the first time in our 24 years as a university, we featured in the prestigious Times Higher Education Global University rankings. This places us among the top two to five percent of universities anywhere in the world. And you are an integral part of that success. And for that, we thank you. Whatever career you enter, make sure you embrace changes and advances, challenging, provoking, and implementing new ideas. Do not be so proud as to not recognize the inevitability of change and how it will challenge your own practice and career. To quote Albert Einstein, whoever undertakes to set himself as a judge of truth and knowledge is shipwrecked by the laughter of the gods. Before I close, I'd like to make special mention of your friends and families who provided you with support during that education. Moral, spiritual, often financial support for many of you have helped you on the journey to get to today. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the staff across ARU who've contributed to so many aspects of your courses, together with acknowledging our governing board whose wisdom and guidance has helped shape this university. I wish you well wherever your ARU degree takes you, and I hope in coming years that you continue a relationship with our university. Our success and your success are inextricably linked. Enjoy the day, congratulations, and Anglia Ruskin University, our university, would not be where it is today without you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor. We now come to the presentation of those receiving awards today to the Vice-Chancellor. And I should explain at this point that every year we have a competition for the loudest applause at one of these ceremonies. Now, it's usually the nurses and midwives that, that win, but last year, would you believe, it was the lawyers. So let's see how the nurses and midwives and social workers can do this morning. I now call upon Pro Vice-Chancellor and Dean Professor Ruth Taylor to read the names of those who will be presented from the Faculty of Health, Social Care and Education. Professor Taylor. Vice Chancellor, it is my pleasure to present to you graduates from the Faculty of Health, Social Care and Education. For the award of Bachelor of Science with Honours Nursing Child, Louise Braun. <laughs> Elizabeth Evans. <laughs> Yesenia Tanner. <laughs> For the award of Bachelor of Science with Honours Nursing Adult, Carla Abing. <laughs> Christina Alexandra Allen. <laughs> Faith Amalu. <laughs> Angela Leslie Aspinall. The next graduate also receives the Provide Outstanding Student Award and the Dean's Award for the Department of Health, Social Care and Education, Chloe Jamesa Bates. Congratulations, Chloe. Very well done. Claire Benny. Well done, Claire. Do your best. Natalie Botchway. <laughs> well done, Natalie. All the best. Kim Bowd. Congratulations, Kim. All the very best for you. Emma Jane Briscoe. Congratulations, Emma. All the very best for you. James Colley. Congratulations, Emma. Very well done. Isabella Violetta Chawinska. Hannah 
die. Victoria Emily Ferguson. <laughs> Catherine Lois Garside. Congratulations, Catherine. All the best. Fiona Gilbert. Congratulations, Fiona. All the very best. Mary Gill. Well done, Mary. All the very best. Tanvia Goni. Congratulations, Tanvia. All the best. Kirsty Guerrier. Congratulations, Kirsty. All the very best. Amy Hancock. Congratulations, Amy. All the very best. Abby May Ellen Hayes. <laughs> Michelle Hydes. Well done, Michelle. All the very best for you. Emily Evelyn Hines. Well done, Emily. All the best. Nella Eliva. Congratulations, Nella. All the very best. Adama Jallo. Anyway, Katona. Isolt Elizabeth Lee. Congratulations, very well done indeed. Chipolena Mabia. Well done, all the very best of the future. Holly Mason. Bongay Mavangira. Very well done indeed. All the very best. Louise McAvoy. Congratulations, Louise. Good luck with you. Ashley McGonagall. Congratulations, Ashley. All the best. Rosie Alice Mitchell. Very well done, Rosie. All the very best with you. Melanie Maloney. Congratulations, Melanie. All the very best. Akiko Joanne Nellis. Congratulations, all the very best. Blessing and Kube. Congratulations, very well done indeed. Donna Louise Orm. Congratulations, all the very best. Natasha Amy Louise Parfit. Congratulations, Natasha. All the best. Claire Ranger. Congratulations, Claire. Very well done indeed. Melanie Jane Richardson. Well done, Melanie. All the very best. <laughs> Deborah Jane Sunderland Strutt. Congratulations. All the very best for the future. <laughs> Danielle Sussex. Congratulations, Danielle. All the very best. Amy Wake. <laughs> well done, Amy. All the very best. Hang White. Congratulations. All the very best. Kelsey Whitty. Very well done, Kelsey. All the very best. Katie Wrights and Routon. Congratulations. All the very best. Salome Yaboa. Vice Chancellor, that partially completes the list of graduates for me to present to you today. I now invite one of our distinguished senior academics, Dr. Anne Develing, to address you. Good morning, graduands. We are here this morning to celebrate your success. You have completed several years of academic study while developing the skills and know-how to become teachers and or support those who need help from our health and social services. 
Many of you have also achieved registration with those statutory bodies that regulate professional practice in the UK. Hence, you are deemed safe to practice, safe and knowledgeable to protect the vulnerable, teach children and care for those currently experiencing ill health. At the weekend, I attended another celebration to commend the 100th anniversary of the work of the American educational philosopher John Dewey. While you may not be familiar with his writing, you will be aware of debates that he has influenced of the need for professional practitioners to critically reflect on how they can offer a good service in what are often challenging situations. Dewey developed his work in turbulent times. Against a backdrop of the First World War, the associated breakdown of community and social cohesion, financial uncertainty, and pressurized resources. While the context of our public service is different to that of the early 20th century in providing health, social care, and education today, you will face a range of 21st century challenges which will require you to seek ways to offer good public service within constrained resources and in the face of increasing demand. Dewey suggests that to achieve this, one must develop what he refers to as practical wisdom. That is, the ability to use one's learning to solve real day-to-day -day problems we encounter in our working situations. The question of how you use the learning and experience you have worked so hard to achieve is an important one to consider because the knowledge and skills you have acquired over the last years can make a real difference in people's lives. An eminent teacher of professional practice in the USA, Professor Barbara Stengill, suggests that those who offer public service in challenging situations need to have an optimistic demeanor. She counsels against naive or arrogant optimism any idea that we might have all of the answers, clearly impossible, or even that we are always going to get it right. Optimism, in her view, is about being honest and confident about what you know today, but believing and seeking a better understanding and alternative solutions throughout your careers. So what can you do to foster, and more importantly, retain this optimism. While you have been studying for your degrees and diplomas, many of you have also had the opportunity to work with practice supervisors, mentors, and professional experts who have been role models of excellent practice. And I know that you will want to join with me in thanking them for the huge contribution that they have made in helping you to achieve your awards today. The communities you work with going forward will continue to be a source of inspiration and exemplars of expertise. As Aristotle said in his famous work on ethics, looking at a good person will show you how a good person should look. Please stay in touch with us, your university and faculty. We would like to hear about what you are doing and continue to have you involved in our research with our current students and further learning with us. Finally, remain open to learning from your client groups, really taking on board their perspectives and considering their preferred solutions. Professor Stengel, along with other eminent thinkers, suggests that however significant the challenges you face going forward, keeping a clear focus on your purpose, on what motivated you to enter the profession or the work that you're engaging with, will enable you to maintain consistent optimism. I would like to end by reminding you that what you have achieved and we are celebrating here today already indicates that you have the right stuff to meet this challenge. Within your courses, you have faced and addressed a daunting academic and practical workload, no doubt sacrificing family and social time to meet these demands. You have had to reconsider taken for granted views and feelings confront unexpected and unfamiliar situations, 
and overcome a number of unexpected difficulties that at times may have seemed insurmountable barriers to achieving your goals. Today, we are proud of you, and you should be proud of yourselves, not least because what you have learned over the last years will enable you to make a positive difference in people's lives. The knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm you will bring to the teams that you are going to work with are much needed and very valued. Congratulations to you all. Thank you, Dr. Devlin. We now come to the final list of those receiving awards today, and I once again call upon Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean, Professor Ruth Taylor, to read the names of those remaining from the Faculty of Health, Social Care, and Education. I now continue with the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Health, Social Care, and Education. For the award of foundation degree in the sciences management of social and affordable housing, Ellen Furs. For the award of Bachelor of Arts with Honours Social Work, Samantha Grange Hall. <laughs> Kelly Homan. Abby Christina Evat. Tracy McKenty Powell. Well done, Tracy. Hope it all works out well for you. Elizabeth Wall. Congratulations, Elizabeth. All the very best. For the award of Bachelor of Science with Honours Acute Care, Emily Hazel. Well done, Emily. All the very best for you. Michelle Ellen Medson. Congratulations, Michelle. All the very best. For the award of Bachelor of Science with Honours Mental Health, Cleopatra Florence Zulu Firi. For the award of Postgraduate Certificate Primary Education Initial Teacher Training, Zoe Sharp. Well done, Zoe. All the very best for for the award of Foundation Degree in the Sciences, Health and Social, Social Care, Scott Daniel Cree. Congratulations, Scott. All the very best for the future. Amy Elizabeth Curtin. Congratulations, Amy. All the very best. For the award of Master of Science, Medical and Healthcare Education, Stephanie Ruth Fuller. For the award of Master of Science Advanced Practice, Zoe Christine Keast. Congratulations, Zoe. All the very best for the future. Vice Chancellor, that completes the list of graduates for me to present to you today. end of the ceremony, but first I would invite Claire Benny, one of our wonderful new graduates, to come to the podium to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of those receiving awards today. Claire. Vice-Chancellor, honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, fellow graduates. It's my pleasure to offer the vote of thanks today for myself and on behalf of all of the students graduating at this ceremony. Firstly, I would like to thank all of the staff at Anglia Ruskin University, both lecturers and those behind the scenes, for their support and continued efforts in making all of the course contents engaging and accessible to all students. The right to education is not something freely afforded across the globe, and so it's only right that we be thankful for the opportunity to pursue a vocation. It is a privilege which, looking to the future, will exponentially increase the options open to us all. 
For those of us here today who have had practical placements as part of our degrees, thanks is also due to mentors and co-workers. In being generous with both their time and their expertise, they have helped to mould us and shape us into professionals of the future. I'm sure that all of us who have donned a cap and gown today have family, friends and partners to whom we would like to extend our most personal and most heartfelt of thanks. To complete a degree necessitates a multitude of sacrifice. And for myself, and I'm sure everybody in this room, these sacrifices have impacted the lives of those closest to us. How grateful we should be to celebrate with these people who have supported us. They deserve more thanks than I can articulate here. To all of the graduates here today, I don't think it's too self-serving to suggest that we give ourselves a little credit, primarily for our support of each other. Whether for encouragement, advice, or for information, I have found there to be no better so source of support than from other students. I can only speak of my own experience, but if all of the courses here today are simultaneously as testing, humbling, and entertaining as the nursing degree which myself and my course mates have undertaken, this peer support has been invaluable. As such, I believe that many of the friendships forged here will stand the test of time. Finally, I'd like to congratulate everyone graduating today. To complete courses such as these, to get up early, to work late nights, to study instead of socialize, to forgo financial incentives and to persist, persist when completion seems a long way away takes persistence, determination and grit. Today, as we mark the fruition of all of this work, we should thank ourselves for investing in our futures. We should be proud of ourselves because now we can proceed into our chosen fields, aptly qualified, to do work that we can feel passionate about. And there are a few things to be more thankful for than that. Thank you. Claire, thank you very much. I now call for one final time on the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Ian Martin, to address the graduates. And now, will those who have been presented to me here today on the stage please stand. As Vice-Chancellor of Anglia Ruskin University, I hereby admit you to the degrees, diplomas and awards for which you have been presented to me today. As a member now of the community of scholars, take all that you have learned into society and uphold the values of freedom and thought and scholarship. Our warmest congratulations to you all. At this point, I'm going to go off script, and I'd just like you to turn to face your friends, family, and supporters and applaud them in the way that you have done for the, all the support that they've given you. <laughs> Once again, congratulations. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the ceremony and I declare the proceedings closed. Will you please now all stand for the academic procession. Thank you.